Welcome and thanks for joining me today. I want to discuss a very fascinating uh, point of similarity between um, the thought of Karl Marx and uh, St. Basil in the book of Acts. And so this was just a fascinating discovery for me that I made in my book, um, All Riches Come From Injustice. Um, this one here that just came out about three months ago. I am wearing my Marx shirt for the occasion. <laughs> Um, and I think it's really interesting, this um, very similar description of what the ideal economic arrangement, the ideal um, administration of resources should be that is shared by both St. Basil um, in the 4th century and Karl Marx in the 19th century, and then, of course, much earlier in Acts, uh, which we'll look at as well. And so let me start with uh, Marx and what he had to say. Towards the end of the critique of the Gotha program, Marx offers a description of what an ideal socialist or communist society would look like. And um, something that's frequently misunderstood about Marx is that he was an was ardently opposed to any sort of utopian projections of the future. The majority of Marx's work is um, aimed at critically analyzing um, the present situation of capitalism, including its contradictions, which necessitate the move towards socialism. Um, but this passage from the Critique of the Gotha Program is one of the very few instances where Marx actually tries to describe something of what a future society beyond capitalism might look like. And as such, his phrase um, that I'll describe here has become somewhat of a slogan for the socialist movement. But again, I want to clarify that the, this is something that Marx did with a lot of hesitation. He wasn't prone to predicting the future. He was more interested in critically um, analyzing capitalism capitalism and its current uh, contradictions. And so Marx describes a more advanced phase of communist society, one that has overcome the contradictions of labor and capital. And what he uses to describe this um, society is that it would inscribe itself on the banner with this phrase, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. So read it again because it's a really important phrase for um, some of the socialist thought from each according to his abilities and to each according to his needs. And so this establishes a kind of ideal arrangement of administrating resources. Under capitalism, need is always secondary to greed. Uh, the central driving feature of the capitalist system is its endless quest for capital accumulation. As Marx says in Capital Volume 1, quote, accumulate, accumulate. That is Moses and the prophets, end quote. The capitalist system is one in which every knee must bow and every tongue confess that mammon is Lord. The goal of production in capitalism is accumulation. But what this means is that meeting human needs always comes second to, to uh, profit in the capitalist system. Only if a need can be met for profit are they actually met under capitalism? Um, that's an oversimplification of it, of course, but that's the general um, outline here that's important to note, is that under capitalism, it's not needs that are met primarily. Rather, the engine that drives capitalism is accumulation. The accumulation of capital for fewer and fewer people, uh, which leads to monopolization and financialization, which is what Marx deals with in some of the later volumes. Um, but this is also why scarcity is manufactured within capitalism as an irrevocable feature of capitalism. Um, because if there is scarcity of human needs and wants, then there can be enormous profity, profits derived from that scarcity. Um, so take, for example, uh, the privatization of water and of shelter, basic human needs for living. Um, large real estate investors will hoard thousands of homes, which creates a housing crisis, which eff effectively restricts the ability to own a home for millions of people. This is also the dynamic of why there are hundreds of thousands of homeless people in America living on the streets, yet we have millions of homes that sit empty as speculative investments. And so the problem of homelessness isn't that we don't don't have enough homes. It's that people have hoarded homes for something other than meeting needs. And so I think that's a good example of um, why capitalism actually doesn't care about meeting needs. It only cares about making profit. Needs come second, only if you can make profit off of needs. And so 
Capitalism does not meet human needs evenly or adequately. It cannot meet human needs in a fair and humane, humane way because the goal of capitalism is not to meet needs, but to accumulate more capital for the capitalist class, for the rich. And so what Marx here is envisioning with this phrase is a new arrangement in society, one that has overcome the contradictions central to the capitalist mode of production. And Marx describes that a society like this from each according to ability and to each according to need everybody gives what they can and they receive what they need but what's important to recognize here is that with marx this phrase either consciously or unconsciously comes directly from the new testament um, and the new testament vision of what an ideal society should look like and so we see these these phrases in uh, acts 2 and 4 and then also in acts 11. Acts 11 reads, the disciples determined that according to their ability, each should send relief to the believers living in Judea. This is in the context of a prophesied uh, famine and the response of the disciples to that famine. And so it is clear that in a time of need, the response of a Christian community is to give out of one's ability. But then we look further in Acts 2 and 4, we find a clear description of an early communal sharing among the first Christians. Acts 2, uh, 44 through 45 reads, All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. And then in Acts 4, we see something very similar. Uh, the writer of Acts felt it was necessary to describe this community twice, which I think is a moment of emphasis. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them. I um, write in my book, All Riches Come From Injustice, that this is shaped in such a way that it's fulfilling the um, promise of Deuteronomy that there will be no needy person among you. I think it's Deuteronomy 15. And so this is a great example of what the early Christian community tried to practice and live out uh, in their day-to-day -day life. And so another example, though, comes from St. Basil. And so maybe we could argue that the New Testament says that, but early church didn't really do this. But you know, that's the exact thing that I'm trying to disprove with my book is that the early church had a remarkable um, anti-mammon flavor to its its teachings. And so Basil the Great was a fourth century theologian known for establishing uh, what has been called the very first hospital, which also functioned as a house of for the poor, a food pantry and a monastery. Uh, this was known as the Basiliad. It was a monastic community that actively provided for the needy and, the, and cared for the sick. Um, so in a, a homily that Basil gave on Psalms 14, he describes the ideal administration of resources, and he does so in terms that are surprisingly similar to Karl Marx. Basil writes, There are then many who, going beyond the use of what is necessary, turn poverty into an occasion for profit and a source for disgraceful pleasures. Hence, those who have charge of the poor must form a common treasury and with wise administration distribute to each according to his need. Basil describes in the first half the practice of usury, most likely, um, which was a means of charging interest on a loan and thus turning poverty into a means of profit. And so this was an exploitative practice that throughout the early church was rejected as um, sinful and wrong. And actually, most priests were banned from practicing usury up until really the Reformation. And so uh, that's what Basil is describing at first, is this, this concept of, of exploiting the poor for profit. And I think there's endless parallels for us today where uh, the rich will exploit the poor for profit, whether it's through extracting labor and forcing uh, poor um, wage conditions, poor living conditions, anything like that in order to extract as much profit as possible. Um, but Basel is rejecting that. Um, and so what the second half of it that is extremely interesting is that Basil is describing the ideal form of administration. Those who are in charge of the poor, this is how they should operate. Um, it's notable that he doesn't push this back on the poor and say the poor need to just get a job. They need to work for themselves. They need to do this. He says, no, the resources need to be distributed according to their needs. If there's a need, the resource needs to be distributed to those people of a need. And so this 
in, is a really interesting way of connecting the uh, Christian social ethic explicitly with Marx's vision of how capitalism needs to be overcome and the problems with the economic system of capitalism. In both visions, the ideal arrangement of society is one in which each receives according to their needs. Administering wisely thus entails prioritizing the needs of the people over the greed of the few. And I think that's the sticking point for me of the necessity of an anti-capitalist political ethic within the church is this need to reverse the current system, which relies entirely on just the endless accumulation of capital for the greedy, fewer and fewer hands that are just hoarding this amass, great ama amount of wealth that they could never spend in thousands of lifetimes. Yet at the same time, there are millions who will suffer and die from unnecessary conditions such as food. Um, I think this is an example I've brought up on this channel before, but we produce enough food, we in the global sense produce enough food to feed 10 billion people every year, yet we still have millions of people that starve and suffer and die or die from uh, malnutrition or any other uh, hunger-related diseases and the only rational explanation for this is because capitalism as a system has prioritized the greed of the few over the needs of the many. Because every year, capitalism makes this choice to let millions of people suffer and to die uh, rather than to distribute food, not for profit, but for need. I want to stress here that the goal of ending capitalism is because there is a better system that's possible, a system that is determined by meeting everybody's needs and not by prioritizing accumulation. And so another world is possible, and it's one that was envisioned by the early church, and it's why I, I'm quite passionate about stressing that um, a Christian faith that does not take seriously the anti-mammon witness both of Jesus and of the early church is not a faith that's true to the gospel. The gospel includes this dimension of care for the least of these in such a way, not just that we give charity, but that we imagine a new arrangement of society wherein the first shall be last and the last shall, shall be first. And so that's an eschatological reversal of the current systems of the world. But it's an important aspect, I think, for today to proclaim this message. And so I hope this brief examination has been thought-provoking for you. Um, in my book, I, I talk a lot more about these sort of issues, and I'm sure there's a lot of concerns that are raised about uh, Marx. It, it's funny because Marx is kind of a bad word. You say his name, and, and it's like the boogeyman. Um, but there's no reason necessarily to be afraid of Marx's insights as they're related to a critical analysis of capitalism. Um, and so I discuss that some in the book. I, I do do a lot of work to discuss that in the book. The last two chapters of my book deal with that. So if you're curious, definitely pick it up. Um, I also do a lot more examples like this of um, things that I think are really important to note about the early church and, and the Bible and as it relates to an anti-capitalist political ethic. Um, and so with that said, I hope this video was helpful and, and you found it thought provoking. Um, let me know what you think in the comments below, but for now, thank you so much for watching and hope you have a good day.